peace and mercy are yours from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My dear friends, you may have been hearing this this past week. It is the trial of the century. At least maybe that's what they're saying at this point. Maybe some of you have been tuned into it, or maybe you're just so sick of the whole thing that you've tuned out and you've said to yourself, why does this even matter to me personally? But for those of you who like court cases or you like watching court TV or reruns of Law and Order, you're very familiar with what is in our lesson this morning, a court case. And really, it is more than the trial of the century. It is a trial of all trials. And each and every one of you is there. Because today we're going to court. Today we have been summoned to appear before a judge and a jury, and there are no false accusations here. There is plenty of evidence against us. After all, as you appear in this court, you are 100% guilty. You know it. Everyone else knows it. And the judge is not one that you can deceive. In fact, the judge is the very creator of the entire universe, and he knows absolutely everything about you. In fact, he has every right to condemn you, not just in this life, but for an eternity in hell. So how will you plead? Well, that's exactly what the prophet Micah was sent to his people to ask some 2,700 years ago, as we see today recorded in Micah chapter 6. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up. Plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people, and he is lodging a charge against Israel. I'm just going to stop there for a moment. If you look at Micah here, as the district attorney for God, you see that in his very opening statement, the accusations that he levels against us and the questions that he asks will immediately incriminate us. After all, Micah, along with the prophet Amos and Isaiah, had been sent to the nation of Israel. They had gone to the people and prophesied that unfortunately the northern kingdom of Samaria was going to be destroyed by the Assyrians. They also were there to let the people of Judah know that eventually they would be taken away into exile. And maybe in some ways how we make fun of lawyers today that people don't like them, you just have to imagine the prophets. The people certainly didn't like hearing this from the prophets. They were living in wicked evil times, their priests had abandoned the truth, their political leaders had gone astray, and the people, unfortunately, had just let all of this happen. Now anyone who would stand up with the truth was going to bring on themselves pain and misery. It was not going to be easy. And every single one of these prophets as the years went on, they encountered more and more resistance and a, and a hardening of heart from the people. The people didn't want to listen to them. They didn't want to hear that they were doing the wrong thing, living the wrong way. They only wanted to hear what their itching ears wanted to hear. They wanted to be told that everything was fine, that God didn't really notice their rejection and their rebellion. They wanted to hear that their God was a loving and merciful God who would never in a million years come and destroy their beloved land and his people. In some ways, it sounds a bit like the smiling pastors out there, the politicians and the Hollywood types who want to tell you, just believe whatever you want to believe, just have faith in something. Well, what does that mean? They want to discount the fact that hell exists and, and make the claim that our God is such a loving God that 
he would never condemn anyone to hell. And they go on to perpetuate the feel-good lie that eventually everybody gets to heaven, and then they're up there and they're looking down on us, and it is so wonderful. But what does our God have to say to that? Well, if you go back to this trial of trials, you see that we have to stand before a rather unusual jury. Not a jury made up of our peers who may get us off on some technicality because they are equally as guilty as we are. But a jury made up of mountains and hills. Why in the world mountains and hills? If you go back in Israel's history, you see how mountains and hills often played a very key role in the people's relationship with their God. Take, for example, the picture of it, Mount Sinai. That's where God created that covenant with his people, gave them his law. Then you have Mount Zion there in Jerusalem where the temple is built. Now both of these mountains really represented to the people God's presence where they could see it, where they could feel it, where they could hear it. Both of these sacred places in the nation of Israel or for the nation of Israel really were places that the people understood God's full extent of his power and his law. But it didn't take very long for the people to eventually wander away to other mountains and hills where they would build their own altars and their shrines, all sorts of false gods. On these mountains and hills, they would practice all sorts of disgusting rituals and practices. And so then it is fitting that the mountains and hills who had borne witness to both God's love and also the people's rebellion would now sit in the jury box to decide the fate of Israel. And Micah, as he presents this case, it's clear cut. There are no holes in his evidence. There is not going to be the chance for us to plead for leniency or for a mistrial. The people of Judah, the people of Israel were guilty. They had rebelled against their God, and now it was God, the judge's turn to speak to the accused. As the case unfolds, this is what God asked the jury to consider. He says, my people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Now, you don't see this often, but almost in a sarcastic tone, God is saying, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you, people? I haven't done anything to you. In fact, I've always been there for you, even when you rejected me, even when you hated me, even when you rebelled against me. Don't you remember your history, Israel? Remember how you were down in Egypt and I sent Moses to rescue you from the land of slavery? Well, what did you do? Well, you weren't satisfied. You started to grumble and complain almost right away. Then you went and built this golden calf and bowed down and worshipped it when you thought Moses was taking too long. And how about that time when you were right there on the border of the promised land? And I told you, go on in, it's yours. And you turned your back and said, there's no way we can conquer those people. And yet still I was there for you. I was there for you as you journeyed through the desert for 40 more years. And then finally, as you entered into the promised land, when that person, Balaam, came out to curse you, in fact, I changed it around to be a blessing for you. Over and over again, I have proved how much I love, how much I care for you. Over and over again, I have taken care of my people. And yet, how did the nation of Israel repay God? often by turning their backs on him, rejecting him in favor of the wicked and pagan ways of this world. 
Now, as we sit here this morning, what can we learn from the example of Israel? Well, unfortunately, maybe God needs to say to us, what have I done to you? What burdens have I placed in your life? Do you not remember your history with me? Do you not remember what I did to make you my child? Because unfortunately, it doesn't take much for us to turn our backs on God, to reject him as well, to go against our God and instead to turn to the lies and the charms of this world. In fact, there's even a strong pull right this moment here in church by the devil and the world to get us away from God. And living in this world today where it seems like the wicked is only increasing sometimes it may cross our minds wouldn't it just be a whole lot easier to give in to the madness and the evil that's around us but when that happens we soon find out that life is not going to get any better for us in fact when we start to consider that sin is no big deal then we see where it's leading us and it's leading us straight to death and we know it could be better don't we We know, unfortunately, we're the only ones to blame because we can't blame our parents. We can't say, well, they didn't do enough for us. And we can't blame our friends because we say, well, they tempted us. And we can't even blame the devil because, unfortunately, we were the ones who fell headfirst right into his traps. So then what are we to do? Well, perhaps we could do some things to get God to notice us once again. Maybe we could come up with a solution to our sin. Maybe it would involve bribing the judge so that he would be nice to us once again. Maybe it would be offering all sorts of sacrifices so that he would like us again. Now, if you've ever thought that way, well, you're not alone because there are people from every generation who have thought the same thing. In fact, you hear that complaint from the accused as we read. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? But unfortunately, that never works. Sadly, no matter how hard we try, no matter how many sacrifices we offer, no matter how good we are, it's just not enough. We would never be able to pay off one single sin that we've committed. There's no way on earth we could ever think that God would forget that mountain of evidence against us. We are absolutely guilty. The evidence is clear cut. God's case against us tells us that we're guilty and we're the only ones to blame. We deserve to be sentenced to death for all our crimes against him. Case closed. But then the case bursts wide open. Because our God is not done showing his love and his faithfulness. You see that with the nation of Israel. God was not done this rebellious people no god was going to bring them back eventually from that exile but even greater than that god would bring about that covenant he made with abraham that a light was going to dawn in israel god was about to bring a leader a prophet a priest and king unlike anything the world had ever seen to change everything Because God was going to send his son Jesus to take the punishment that we deserved. That Jesus would come into this world and dying on the cross, he would free us from the chains we have to sin and to death and our own sinful nature. Jesus would bear the wrath of our God. He would be that perfect once and for all, that final sacrifice that we needed. His innocent blood would be shed for us. But as the disciples found an empty tomb three days later, it proved 
that that marvelous, miraculous plan of salvation had worked. And now Jesus stands in heaven. And he has a new verdict for us. Not guilty. Case closed. Now those words are so sweet in our ears. But now that we have been declared not guilty, what does that mean for our life as we live in the light? Does it mean that we go back into the darkness, wandering around, listening to the lies and the charms of this world? Do we treat it as this out-of-jail-free card in our back pocket? Well, certainly not. In fact, Micah tells us this, and he encourages, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now Micah's words ring out loud and clear for us today. When you've seen the light, when you've seen what Jesus has done for you, it's time to start acting just like his disciples, just like a follower, just like his children, showing good to others. Not going out there and doing all sorts of good because you're hoping for the praise of this world or for some self-righteous purpose. But doing good because you know who you are. That you're joining together with brothers and sisters in the faith, going out there acting with justice and mercy, walking humbly before your God because you have been given a new lease on life. But now use that new life. Honor the one who has freed you from sin and death. Today, brothers and sisters, we can enter into that courtroom of our God with full confidence because we know exactly what the verdict is. We know what our Savior has declared. We know that the punishment we deserved was leveled against him. And yet, he's also given us the best legal defense the world has ever seen. So motivated by his love and his sacrifice for you, go out there and do good. Act justly, show mercy, walk humbly before the Lord because God has rested his case. You're not guilty. Case closed.